What's up, guys? Welcome to the Voice of Boise Show, episode four. And like I said before, from LeBron James, Kobe Bryant, Steph Curry, my guest Heather Cox has interviewed them all. So this is going to be an exciting episode. Heather, thanks so much for coming on. I appreciate it. Thanks yeah. for having me. Yeah, so... A lot of pressure. You're saying it's going to be exciting. Let's hope so. No. <laughs> no. no. Um, I, I just want to... I, I admire what you do uh, and what you have done in the broadcast world. So just to start it off... Kobe Bryant has been always a, one of my favorite players. My girlfriend, it has, they have the same birthday. So uh, you have got the chance to interview, interview him multiple times. Um, kind of take me through that. How was that experience? What that was like? Was there anything that you took from him? Oh, How gosh. was that? What didn't I take from him? Yeah. I mean, truly, Kobe is one of a handful of athletes that I look at the things that I learn from them mm -hmm. on almost a daily basis. Mm -hmm. um, and the things that really strike me as the most special and most meaningful are actually the things that nobody ever saw on camera. Mm -hmm. It's the time off camera, behind the scenes, you know, at shoot arounds, at practices, walking, you know, through the halls of Staples, sure. um, you know, getting ready to do an interview and just the chit chat. Yeah. Those are the things that I really remember. I mean, the conversations that we had about family, um, he loved his girls like nothing I've ever seen. And, yeah. and just to see the type of father he was and the way he loved his girls. And, you know, we'd talk volleyball and basketball all the time. Right, uh, right. We have daughters about the same age. Mm -hmm. um, and we would talk about volleyball. You know, they both played volleyball and basketball. And so mm -hmm. he would ask me about Allie and how her sports are going and, and about Will. And uh, it was more the connection that means so much to me. Mm -hmm. But then in terms of the things that I learned from him, I mean... I could, we could spend hours just on Kobe. Yeah. Um, what a the, work ethic. The work ethic is the thing that really stands out. Yeah. And the leadership. For sure. You know, it's really interesting because there are so many people in this world that could be professional athletes. Right. That have the physical gifts to be professional athletes. Absolutely. And what I've learned is the ones that actually make an amazing career out of it, it's not their physical attributes that set them apart and defines Man, them. That is so true. It's their heart. It's their work ethic. It's their brain. Yeah. I mean, like the... LeBron is an incredibly smart man. Right. Um, Kobe is incredibly smart, um, dedicated, the work ethic, yeah. the, the leadership in terms of his drive to get the most out of not just himself, but yeah, everybody around man. him. I mean, he made me better at my job. He made everybody better at their jobs that, you know, encountered him on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. And, um, that was, and, and also that just the respect that, you know, he appreciates people that, do their job well yeah. and that care and have a passion For and sure. want to get better. Yeah. And um, that was always felt. And mm -hmm. uh, he, you know, he was an amazing man and definitely a huge loss. Well, you make a great point too of how a lot of these athletes, it's not just skill and talent, it's the attributes there too. Mm -hmm. You know, LeBron James runs a successful business outside of basketball. Kobe Bryant had a successful business that was in process as well too. Right. Um, and you look at Tom Brady even, the skills were there, but the work ethic was embedded into them of you know his health, um, his family, everything was aligned. And then when football time comes, they're aligned spiritually, physically, emotionally, mm -hmm. and intellectually. So that's awesome to hear. So Heather, take me even more into, you know, you've had great success in the broadcast industry, um, but you've been a woman covering male-dominated sports, right? Mm -hmm. And coming out of being a volleyball player and all that, was there any um, at the beginning um, of some animosity there or some? setbacks there of people saying, well, what do you, you know, what do you talk about football for right. or basketball, whatever? How was that overcoming that and rising through the ranks through that? You know, David, it's interesting. I, I don't know if it's ignorance is bliss and mm -hmm. I'm just clueless, but I really don't ever feel like it's been a, an issue. Um, That's awesome. I, I shouldn't say ever. Yeah. There's a handful of times. I mean, over a 25 year career, I can think right now of three times where I thought, you know what, that wasn't cool. Yeah. I was just treated differently. But I mean, that's such a small percentage in terms of my overall experiences of being in a male dominated industry for right. my entire career. Right. I, I can tell you that most of the time um, between the athletes I was covering, the production truck, everybody I was around, I was normally the only woman there. Right. Um, and I was fine with it and right. I loved it. I mean, it was super comfortable. Um, again, I, I feel like as long as you treat people the way you want to be treated mm -hmm. and expect the respect that you give people, mm -hmm. you get it in return. And I, love that. I, I just think it's really important to 
um, not allow people to treat you differently because you're a woman or because you're, you know, anything. Right. Um, we are all the same. Come on. And as long as we're doing our job well, Absolutely. that's what matters. Absolutely. Um, whether you're a male or female, um, you know, there's there's a couple instances, and I'll, I'll tell you one. Yeah. Um, uh, with a coach. Actually, I'll tell you, it's Jimbo Fisher at Florida State. Okay. And I was doing an interview, and I had covered them. They were, you know, at the top of their game for a long time. Won a national championship time. 2013, I think. A lot yeah. of national championships. Yeah. And we were doing the Saturday Night Primetime ABC Game of the Week. It was yeah. Brent Musburger and Kirk Herbstreet. So we were in Tallahassee a lot. For sure. And so I had worked with Jimbo a bunch. Mm -hmm. And there was one instance where I realized, you know what, he doesn't know me. Um, we were mm. talking about Jameis Winston, who had a sprained ankle. Mm -hmm. We were doing a live sports center hit in, outside of his office. And we finished, and I was asking a little bit more about the ankle because the game was the next day, and I yeah. just really needed some information. And he said, well, Heather, you wouldn't understand this, but a high ankle sprain is a lot harder to come back from wow. than a low ankle sprain. And I looked at him, and there had been a couple instances over the week, yeah. like on the phone. And I said, Coach... Just dawned on me. I don't think you know me very well. Do you have a few minutes? Yeah. We went into his office and you guys chatted. Yeah, and I, I huh. sat down. And I said, Coach, we've worked together a long time, but I really this week it's dawned on me that you don't know me very well. And I just think it's important that you know, like, no, I've never played college football, yeah. but I have played athletics at the highest level. Wow. You know, I played for a national That's championship. Right. I was an academic all American. I have been in the locker room. Absolutely. I know what it's like. And, For sure, you know, yeah. I've had three knee surgeries. I've had high ankle sprains. Yeah. I've had low ankle sprains. And so I went through the, you know, and I really, I felt like I was bragging to him, but I also felt it was really important that he knew me just outside of my broadcast career and that Absolutely. I started as an athlete and that I bring to my broadcasting career the background of an athlete. And I love how you pulled him aside, you guys chatted, but you said something before that is you still had that mindset of abundance of, hey, you know what? Just because I am the only woman or whatever, I'm mm -hmm. still worthy to be here. I'm, right. And I think some people miss that to where, well, it's because of my color or I'm a woman or a male, whatever. Mm -hmm. You need to still have that mindset of, hey, you know, my talent, my God given gift has brought me here. It right. doesn't matter what the odds say. So that's awesome. And that's the end, the happy, the bow on that story is that Jimbo was an entirely different coach to me after that. I mean, really? he gave me information. Like even in halftime interviews where it's tough to get, you know, good stuff. Yeah. He... He gave it to me. So that respect he, was, raised. It changed. It changed everything about our dynamic that and our relationship. So, that's so awesome. Well, to go right into, the segue right into that, you've worked with ABC, NBC, ESP, and all that. So you said you covered Florida State. Was there a time or span in those projects um, that she favored most? That she mm -hmm. said, man, this was a time that even though I covered all these different sports teams, I really enjoyed covering this team or this coach or this culture. Is there a, a few? Gosh, there are, I've, I really have loved every sort of chapter and season of my broadcasting career. Mm -hmm. But the one that stands out when you're saying that is obviously doing that Saturday night primetime game with Kirk and, and Chris. and then, Or mm. excuse me, it was Kirk and Brent, and then it was Chris Fowler and, and Kirk Herbstreet. And, Lee Corso on there, too? Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, he was game day, but yeah, he was always around. <laughs> yeah. um, and that was just, you know, it's... It, an honor and a privilege to get to do. I mean, we were doing the top game of the week every week, and then mm -hmm. we were doing, you know, the Rose Bowl and the Orange Bowl. We we're doing the national semis and then the national championship every year for a long time. Yeah. And so that span of getting to be, you know, part of that crew was very special. Yeah. Um, but also my Olympics. You know, I've gotten to do six Olympic games, and those wow. to me are, you know, I just those I look back and think how fortunate I was. Like I would give. I mean, as athletes, yeah, we man. all want to play in the Olympics. I mean, yeah. we grow up dreaming of being in the Olympics, and then to get to didn't get the um, you know to get to be an Olympian, but to get to broadcast. Those and Olympic I bet games. every Olympics is different. The culture is different. The atmosphere so different. Yeah, I bet that's so awesome. So I mean, with covering these different avenues and coaches and cultures and teams, you know, there has to be that drive in you that keeps you going to say, "I'm more." Uh, you know, mm -hmm. I, I I have more more to offer. So my next question would be, how does one stay driven? How does one stay focused when they reach the pinnacle of the career? I look at a guy, I think of a guy like Nick Saban, mm -hmm. who has won six or seven national championships, but they still have a standard of excellence in their program, in their culture. How does one do that? And how did you do that kind of through, through your career? I think for me, it's all about constantly wanting to learn. Mm. It's about learning and passion. I mean, really, I... 
I learned a long time ago, it's not about trying to be the best. Yeah. Um, we are all the best in different ways. Mm -hmm. And what makes me good at one thing, you're good at another thing. And, um, and trying to be the best mom, the best wife, the best friend, the best daughter, and the best broadcaster is impossible. Mm -hmm. So I really learned it's more about learning every day to be better. And hmm. you know, what do I need to, to do to be better at all of those things, not right. just a broadcaster? And to keep that passion, uh, you know, I, I feel really fortunate that I ha have always gotten to do something that I love doing. And mm -hmm. you know, when I talk to younger people about their path, my biggest message to them is mm. find something that you love. Man. You know, hope that every day, you know, we all have to work. Right. Hope that every day it can be something that you're actually excited about and you mm -hmm. want to get better at and that you're driven to excel in and that it's something that you're passionate about. Because mm -hmm. otherwise it's just not fun. I and agree, man. Life's too short. Right. And I think when you follow your purpose and where you're supposed to go or where God's calling you, things flow to you because you're in the right place at the right time. So mm -hmm. that's really inspiring to hear that. I always, I do a talk, I've talked to a couple of companies about being on the highway of grace or the highway of toil. Mm -hmm. And that highway of grace is if you're called to build, if you're called to be in real estate, if you're called to be a broadcaster, when you get on that, things will flow. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, given you, um, you were, you talked, you talked about being a volleyball player. Touch on that time because you were a leader. People don't know you were a successful volleyball player at Pacific. You guys made it to the national championship. You were a team captain. You played some professional volleyball as well, too. Did you always know you were going to be in broadcasting? I mean, how did you take that drive and then channel it into what, what you're doing now? I didn't know that mm. that's what I wanted to do. But it was finding that, just like you said, that, that drive and that competitive nature. Like, where do I how do I find something that that can channel into? Yeah. And um, it just, it wasn't anything until my senior year that I thought, this is something I think I'd really enjoy. Mm. And most of our matches were televised. And so I got to know it from the athlete side. Yeah. And then started paying a lot more attention, to, you know, from the other side. And, and then when I finished playing professionally, I thought, what is the next best thing? Like, I miss competing. Mm -hmm. And the next best thing is being so close. I mean, I have the best seat in the house. I Absolutely. am right, right there, there, feeling it, hearing it, you know, absorbing it all. And so mm -hmm. I, I thought this is a way to keep sort of on the competition field without actually my knees hurting every day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. For sure. And you said you had how many surgeries on? Three. Three yeah. knees or like ACL or? Um, a little bit of everything on both. But My gosh. Yeah. Okay. So you you have a competitive spirit. Uh, you have a drive. But most, most of all, you are a learner. You want to continue to learn. So uh, my follow-up question would be, what's next? I mean, I know right now you're, you're doing, you're still covering the Olympics and more things, um, but you still have that competitive drive in you. Is there something else that you want to check off? Is there something else that you really want to accomplish or do or cover? What is it? It's interesting that you're saying that because I have reached a contentment yeah. in my life that I am so content with I have gotten to check those boxes. Yeah. Um, I left ESPN after 23 years to go to NBC because it was an NFL opportunity. I hadn't covered the NFL. Yeah. Um, it was an opportunity to do Winter Olympics, which I hadn't done. I had only done Summer Games. Mm -hmm. um, and I, so I got, that's why I left for NBC. And now I am really at a point where I am wanting to be home more. Mm. I am wanting to be more of a mom and a wife and a friend. That's awesome. And do the things that, you know, for 25 years I've spent three days trying to fit in seven days of life every week because wow. I've been on the road for four days and home for three right. and never felt like I was above water ever. Mm. And for the first time in my life, I feel like I go to bed at night like I did it. I did everything I wanted to do today. That's a blessing. And I haven't felt that way since I was 22 or really since, I mean, who knows how yeah. long after, you know, competing for so long. Mm -hmm. So I have, you know, made a conscious choice to cut back. I'm just doing Olympics. Um, and some world championships and one golf event that I love to do. And that's awesome. it's heaven. That's awesome. And you know what? That is a goal of being more involved with your family and being a mom. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. um, so my closing question would be, um, those, of you that, those of you that don't know, um, I emailed Heather, I think four or five years ago, when I just got out of college trying to figure out, I had my broadcast reel and I emailed it to you and said, hey, what do you think? And you gave me some awesome advice and good pointers. Um, any advice to anybody out there, not just in broadcasting, but if they have something in their belly, in their gut, mm -hmm. man, I always wanted to be an entrepreneur. I've always wanted to be a producer, a uh, television personality, et cetera. Mm -hmm. What do they do to take that first step um, towards their goal, towards their destiny? 
Well, I think it's so important to, to listen to your heart and figure out, you know, what drives you, what fuels you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, college to me, everybody's so stressed out about, okay, what should I major in? Mm -hmm. You know, figure it out. Like, if something looks appealing to you, take it. Like, yeah. take all those classes and then really listen to yourself. And, yeah. you know, I really enjoy that. Like, that fuels me. And, okay, now that I know that I love this, yeah. how do I how do I do that for a living? And Absolutely. talk to as many people as you can. Search out experts. Get feedback. And don't say no to any opportunities. I mean, mm. if there's, especially like in broadcasting, everybody says, I want to be on camera. I want to, or right. you know, I want to be a play-by-play. -play. I want to be Al Michaels. Or, right. um, and then say, they say no to the opportunity to be a runner. You know, when, mm. when ESPN comes to town for a Boise State game, like say yes to being say a runner. Yes, say yeah. yes to ev expose yourself to everything you can. Right. And learn every part of the business. So right. even if you want to be a color analyst um, in the future, you know, don't like listen and figure out what the director's doing, what audio is doing, what right. tape's doing, what the producer's doing, because that makes you so much better. Uh, like for me as a reporter down on the field, if I know what's going on in the truck at all times, exactly. I know exactly um, the most efficient way to get my job done because I have a, a vague understanding of what they're all doing. Right. So just to, to know and understand the entire scope of what is going on around you so that you can be really good at what you're doing. That's so good. And I tell people too, you know, they, they say, well, I want to be an artist. I want to be a singer or whatever. I go, okay, well, that's great. You're talented in music. You want to be Kanye. But I watched the Oscars last night. There's people winning Oscars for editing. Mm -hmm. There's people winning Oscars for small shorts. I think Sean Diddy Combs won an Oscar for their short film on uh, Trayvon Martin case. So right. like you said, expand your thinking, expand your avenues to where I know I wanted to sing, but hey, I can write music for plays. Mm -hmm. I can write music for movies. There's a lot of opportunities to use your gifts. So yeah, that's a great Don't be afraid answer. to pivot. Don't you be know, afraid to pivot. Yeah, it's yeah. okay if you all of a sudden are like, you know what, I really want to go in this direction. And exactly. Maybe you'll find your way back to the other one, but probably not because you've probably found your path. Exactly. Heather, Heather Cox dropping some dimes. Heather, thank you so <laughs> much Absolutely. for coming Congrats on. Congrats on your success. Yeah, thank you. And um, yeah.